The reason people started, oh, first of all, I have two requests. If you take a photo of me, please do not put it in Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is a surveillance engine. If you put a photo of somebody in Facebook, Facebook uses that photo to do surveillance. It asks people to state the names of the people that appear in that photo. So, putting a photo of someone in Facebook means you are exposing that person to more surveillance. We could raise the question of whether that's the right way to treat your friends. But I only make this uh, request on my behalf. Don't put any photos of me in Facebook. By the way, Facebook does surveillance of people who don't even have Facebook accounts. If you see a like button, in a page. That means Facebook knows that your IP address visited that page. So we're going to have software to block the like buttons and the like buttons of other companies. <clears throat> Second thing is if you make an audio or video recording and you want to distribute copies, please only in the formats that are favorable to free software, and those are the AUG formats and WebM. No MPEG, no MP3, no uh, QuickTime or Real Player or Windows Media Player, and also no Flash. And second, please put on the uh, license Creative Commons no derivatives because this is a this is a statement of my personal views. <clears throat> so, the reason people started asking me to give talks was because of my work on free software. That's free as in freedom. Software that respects users' freedom. Uh, basically, with software, either the users control the program or the program controls the users. The first case is free software. If the users have certain essential freedoms, then they control the program. Otherwise, it's the program that controls the users. So what did you find out? Did you read Jeannie? Oh, well, I don't know whether she has a desk. But when she calls back, how will you find out? Oh, your personal tracking and surveillance device is on. <clears throat> so, in order for a program to be free software, the users need the four essential freedoms. These are the freedoms that enable the users to have control over the program. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. And freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does things the way you wish. So those two freedoms give each individual user control over what the program does. But individual control is not enough, especially since most users don't know how to program, so they're not going to change the program for themselves. If they were limited to individual control alone, they wouldn't really have much control. So we need collective control as well. For that we need two other freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to distribute modified copies when you wish. Now, if everybody has these freedoms, then any group of users who choose to work together can exercise collective control over the program that they're using. Now, this is really important for non-programmer users as well as for programmers. If you're using a free program, you're typically part of a community of people who use that program. And even if you don't know how to write code, there are others in that community who do. And from time to time, they will study that source code because they want to make some change. And in the process, if there's anything malicious in that source code, they have a chance to see it. And then what are they going to do? They're going to fix it because they don't want that malicious feature. They use the program too. They don't want to be mistreated, so they'll fix it. And then they'll announce, look what I saw. And so the whole community will switch 
to the version which doesn't have the mistreatment. And you will get the corrected version without even paying attention. That's what will happen because wherever you get your updates from, they will switch to the improved version and your next update will get you the improved version. And so the community can protect itself from malware. Contrast this with proprietary software. The users are totally defenseless. The developer has controls the program and the program controls the users. So the developer has power over the users and is aware of this. And of course, power corrupts. So these developers frequently put in malicious features to spy on users, restrict users, even back doors to abuse users. And if the users find out, because sometimes we find out about specific malfeatures, they're still helpless. So the users of proprietary software are defenseless. A proprietary program is an instrument of unjust power. Power for the developer over the users. It's a yoke to subjugate people. Whereas with free software, because of the collective control that the users have, the users can defend themselves. Not perfectly, but it's a lot better than being defenseless. So this is why even non-programmer users have better care about this issue. Now, just as some examples, proprietary programs you may have heard of with known malicious features of one of those three kinds or more include Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, the software in the iThings, Flash Player, the PlayStation 3, the Amazon Swindle, and most portable phones. In fact, uh, Windows and portable phones are known to have universal backdoors. That means that someone can remotely install software changes without asking permission. Which means that any imaginable nasty thing could get put in remotely. And the users can't stop it and they very likely wouldn't even know until it struck. So, <clears throat> on a global scale, proprietary software is like 90% equivalent to malware. Almost all users of proprietary software are using proprietary malware. And I mean the programs that were intentionally put into the products that they bought are malware. And even though this is known, the users, for the most part, are unable to correct this. <clears throat> so, that's basically the issue of free software, which I mention as an introduction. Because this talk is not about the issue of free software. This talk responds to an issue that people sometimes ask me about at the end of a talk about free software. I started the free software movement in 1983, and I announced the plan to develop the GNU operating system, where GNU uh, stands for GNU's not Unix. It's a recursive acronym. The name is a joke, but the project was completely serious to make a free software operating system so it would be possible to use computers without proprietary software. I mean, having identified proprietary software as an evil, what in practice could we do about it? Well, the only thing I could see that I could do was write a, a free operating system and move there and invite everyone else to move there. So that's what GNU is about. Now, GNU was almost complete in 1992. And at that point, Mr. Torvalds freed his kernel, Linux, and a combination of GNU and Linux made a complete free operating system, which was mostly GNU. 
and then people started calling the whole thing Linux, which is not very nice to us. So we ask you to please give us equal mention and call it GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux. And thus give some credit to the system's principal developers. There were hundreds of us working on GNU before Torvald started writing his piece of the system. And we worked for many years. <clears throat> In any case, once GNU slash Linux started to catch on, people started asking me give, to give talks more often about free software. And sometimes at the end they would say, do these ideas apply to anything else? other than software? So I started to think about that question and that's the question this talk is meant to answer. Now, they would typically raise the question as wise guys. They'd say, what about hardware? Should hardware be free? Okay, well let's see what it would look like to apply the same concept to hardware, meaning the same four freedoms. Well. Okay, should your computer be free? Well, should you have the right to use it as you wish? Well, aside from the software, yeah, you do. Okay, so you, for the hardware itself, you've got freedom zero. And for the software, well, that depends whether it's free or not. Uh, what about freedom one to change the hardware? Well, there's no way to change a chip. The nature of chips is, if you tried to change one, you would destroy it completely. And this isn't even anybody's fault. It's not maliciously done. It's just the way chips are. They're made up of these tiny circuits, and how could you possibly rewire them? Uh, so, at some, at some uh, more macroscopic levels, you can change computer hardware to some extent. And nobody's going to try to stop you. So the result is you've got freedom one to the limited extent you could possibly exercise it. What about freedom two? Well, there are no copiers for such hardware. They don't exist outside of science fiction. So freedom two is basically an irrelevant question. And likewise, freedom three. Now, this might change. Uh, if 50 years from now we make all our computers with 3D printers, then we will definitely want free designs to use in our, free, in our 3D printers. But we can let the future take care of future technological issues. It's hard enough just to address the issues that are live today. So that's what I'm going to stick to. And today, there are not copiers for almost any kind of hardware. There are some things you can make from designs with a 3D printer. And so those designs might be a relevant part of the topic, but not hardware. On the other hand, if you have some sort of work of authorship, you can have a copy of that in your computer, and with your computer you can change it, and you can copy it, and you can distribute it. So the question of whether you're free to do so is a question with real practical consequences today. And that's the question I'm going to address. <clears throat> For the most part, if you have a copy of a published work, the only thing that would limit what you can do with it is copyright. Now, that's not totally true. In fact, it's a nasty trend. But you'll find that they're starting to impose end-user license agreements on books. But, recognizing the existence of this additional threat to your freedom, we can mostly formulate the same question as by asking, what should copyright law say about what you can do with your copies of published works? <clears throat> now, to think about that, it's useful to look at the history of copyright law which is closely connected with the history of copying technology. <clears throat> Actually,
actually, could you call the Free Software Foundation and see what they can say about this package? Because there should be somebody there now. What time is it? Yes, it's 9.30 there. There might be somebody there. Um, now, changes in technology can't affect basic moral principles. Those are too deep to be reached by such superficial things. But when we apply our principles to any practical question, we do it by looking at the consequences of various possible actions and then judging those consequences. And a change in the context can alter the consequences of a particular action. For instance, if we could reliably resurrect the dead, then murder wouldn't be so bad. So the judge would say, you killed him, you will pay for his new body, bang. And in the United States, we would all need to carry uninsured murderer insurance but in civilized countries, the National Health Service would take care of it. It's not clear how long the UK will remain a civilized country. Uh, they're doing their best to reduce it to barbarism. One thing that's clear is privatizing government services, except in the case where it results in a competitive market for the public, almost invariably means things will be done badly and without accountability and the workers will be paid less and the public will be shafted too. And the motive for doing so is to increase the profits of the 1%. That's it's just a scheme for that. If it results in a competitive market for the public, then there can be benefits. But outside of that, you know it's corrupt scheme. Anyway, so let's look at the history of copying technology and copyright. Copying began in the ancient world, where you did it by reading one copy and writing another copy. Now, that was rather inefficient technology with certain other interesting characteristics. First of all, it had very little economy of scale. To make, to make 10 copies would take you 10 times as long as making one copy. Second, it required no skill other than literacy itself. Third, it required no equipment other than the equipment for reading and writing. The result was a decentralized system of making copies. Wherever there was one copy and somebody who wanted to do the work to make another, it would be made. <clears throat> now, in the ancient world, there was nothing like copyright. It never occurred to anyone. If you had a copy and you wanted to write another, nobody would try to stop you except in the case where the local potentate didn't like what that book said, in which case he might do horrible things to you, which was, however, not copyright, but something closely related, namely censorship. <clears throat> well, that went along for thousands of years, but then there was a big advance in copying technology, the printing press, which made copying much more efficient, but in a non-uniform way. Here's the situation in the ancient world. Making many copies or one copy were both very slow. The printing press gave us this. Mass production of copies got a lot more efficient, but making one copy did not benefit at all, because the fastest way to do that was still to write it by hand. The reason is that the printing press has an inherent economy of scale. It takes a lot of work to set the type. But once you do that, you can make many identical copies much faster than anyone could write them. A 
another consequence was the printing press and the type were expensive equipment. Most literate people did not own this equipment. They also did not know how to use it uh, because running a printing press is a very different skill from reading and writing. Of course, you pretty much have to know how to read and write to be able to run a press, but you need to know a lot of other stuff too. I suppose it wasn't rocket science and any intelligent person could have learned it, but most of them had no reason to learn it, no occasion, so they didn't. The result of this was a centralized system of producing copies. Copies of any given book would be made in a few places and then transported from there to places where somebody might want to buy them. Copyright began in the age of the printing press. It began as a system of censorship under Queen Mary, who wanted to censor Protestants. So anyone who wanted to publish a book had to get permission from the state. The permission was granted as a theoretically perpetual monopoly to one publisher. Well, that went along uh, for quite a while and was used to censor various different things at different times. Uh, but in the 1680s, the monopoly was allowed to lapse. Sometime later, the publishers clamored to get their monopoly back. But what they got in the Statute of Anne was something different, namely, a copyright that belonged to the author and would last a limited time. I believe it was 14 years renewable once if the author was still alive. <clears throat> and the idea was, was spread that copyright was a system to encourage writing. When the US Constitution was adopted, there was a proposal that authors be entitled to a copyright. This was rejected. That might sound shocking, but what the US Constitution actually says is that Congress is allowed to author to set up a copyright system for the purpose of promoting progress, and that copyright has to last for a limited time. Ever since that decision was made, publishers have been trying to convince the public to forget it. <clears throat> but the idea was that copyright would be an industrial regulation on publishers controlled by the authors, but designed to provide benefits to the general public, which is its justification for existing at all. And that's how copyright operated in the age of the printing press. It only regulated publishers. If you were not a publisher, copyright would not bother you. The re <clears throat> And as a result, copyright was uncontroversial, easy to enforce, and arguably beneficial for society. It was uncontroversial because ordinary readers were not restricted, so they had nothing to complain about. It was easy to enforce because it only had to be enforced against publishers. And it's easy to enforce copyright against publishers because publishers, by their nature, say, here I am, here's what I can offer you. So you go there and you say, where did you get these? Who you know, you go to a bookstore and you say, where did these copies come from? It doesn't require invading everybody's home, everybody's computer, or everybody's network connection. And it was arguably beneficial for the public because the public conceptually traded away part of its natural rights to copy anything at all, rights that it was not in a, in a position to use, because only publishers were in a position to actually copy books. And in exchange for this useless natural right, the public got something useful, namely more books being written. 
So if you trade something you can't use in exchange, you get something you that is of some value to you. At least it's positive. And if we were still in the age of the printing press, I don't think I would be here making a speech criticizing copyright law. But the age of the printing press is gradually giving way to the age of the computer networks. Another advance in copying technology, which once again makes copying more efficient, and once again in a non-uniform way. Here's the situation we had in the age of the printing press. Mass production copying, very efficient and kept getting more so. One-off copying, still rather slow. <laughs> With digital technology, we get something like this. They both benefit, but it's mainly one-off copying that benefits. It benefits a lot more and becomes almost as efficient as mass production copying, bringing us to a situation that's more like the ancient world than like the age of the printing press. Now, what do I mean by it's almost as efficient? Well, consider CDs. Uh, one-off CDs cost more than mass-produced CDs, and they're not quite as robust, but still hundreds of millions of people can make one-off CDs and do. <clears throat> so, the result of this is to change completely the effect of copyright law, even if the law itself had not been changed. The effect in this new context is totally different because the result is copyright restricts everybody. It has now become a restriction on the general public, uh, mainly benefiting and controlled by the publishers in the name of the authors. Which means something fundamentally wrong. And it's therefore no longer uncontroversial. That's why people found political parties based on the demand to change it. It's no longer easy to enforce, because to enforce it against every citizen suggests nasty measures such as invading everybody's internet connection. <clears throat> and it's no longer beneficial, because it's a restriction that we can't stand. <clears throat> so what would a democratic government do under these circumstances? It would reduce copyright power to something that the public can live with. We can measure the lack of democracy today by the tendency of governments to do the exact opposite. They are making copyright stricter when they ought to be making it less constraining. For instance, <clears throat> what, what have we seen in, uh, well first of all, there's, there's a dimension of time. There's a worldwide push to make copyright last longer. In the U.S., copyright was extended several times in the past 50 years. The last time was in 1998, when they passed what we call the Mickey Mouse Copyright Act, because its real purpose was to prevent the image of Mickey Mouse from falling into the public domain. Disney had obtained tremendous benefits from the public domain and appreciates how valuable it is and therefore is firmly determined never to contribute anything to it. <laughs> oh, so they extended copyright by 20 years on both past and future works. Now, extending copyright on past works, how is that going to convince the mostly now dead authors of the past to write more? They need a time machine, and apparently they haven't used it because our history books don't record that in the 20s when authors and artists found out about how their copyrights would be extended they set to work with renewed vigor. Extending copyright on future works 
conceivably might influence the making of works in the future. You don't need a time machine for that, you just need a truly insane author or artist because rationally speaking, the discounted present value of 20 more years of copyright starting 50 years after your death is so small that it wouldn't affect your decisions if you were making them rationally. Uh, the real reason for that law had nothing to do with any of that. That was just uh, excuses to satisfy the Constitution. The real reason was companies like Disney that had legal monopolies that were scheduled to expire wanted to keep those monopolies going. Uh, so they paid for this law. That's how laws are made in the U.S. They're sold. <clears throat> now, if this were limited to the U.S., you would be much better off, but it's not. The European Union, I think, just recently finished extending the copyright on sound recordings by a long period. So, and, and the worst case of this is actually in Mexico, where copyright lasts till a hundred years after the author's death. But you can expect more pressure to extend copyrights if you don't have the kind of government that's determined to refuse. The other dimension of copyright is the dimension of breadth. Which uses of a copyrighted work are actually prohibited? Now, in the age of the printing press, those were an exception. There was a space of all the things that could be done with a published work, and some of them had been regulated by copyright, and the rest people were still free to do. But the publishers have recognized that digital technology gives them the opportunity to seize total control. They want to impose a pay-per-view universe. And they want to do it by turning our technology into our enemy. In other words, with DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, the malicious features that restrict what people can do with the data in their computers. People first saw this with DVDs. That was the first mass medium that was designed with Digital Restrictions Management. <clears throat> and it was set up by the DVD conspiracy which said anyone that wants to make a DVD player is required to join the conspiracy, keep the format secret, and build the DVD players so that they re restrict the users according to the rules, just like all the other DVD players. That's why in the important issues there's no real competition in the area of DVD players. They're all equally bad, because they're all made in the conspiracy. <coughs> This worked for a while, but then other people who were not members of the conspiracy figured out the format and published a free program capable of decoding the secret encrypted format on the DVD. <clears throat> well, that was good. That program started circulating, and as a result it was possible to buy a DVD and watch it using free software. It's on its way. Oh great, it was shipped to someplace else. Oh. It's so surprising when something goes wrong and it can actually be corrected. <laughs> So anyway, <clears throat> the movie companies didn't like that. So they purchased a law in the U.S. banning such software, censoring it. The U.S. practices censorship of software. And in fact, there was a court case which ruled that the distribution of that free program that could play a DVD was forbidden. At that point, people started printing a very simple version of it on shirts and wearing the shirts just to show their disgust for what the government was doing. 
<clears throat> well, if that law were limited to the U.S., it wouldn't affect you. Unfortunately, the European Union approved a directive about this around nine years ago. So censorship of software has spread here as well. Although in some countries they exempted the software for DVDs. A court in Finland ruled that the program was so widespread that the DVD uh, encryption DRM system did not qualify as an effective scheme of technical restriction. Well, that's nice. And I found out recently that in France they simply made an exception for that one. Well, that's nice. Uh, but still, uh, this, the attack on your freedom remains and, is, and does apply to other DRM schemes. Now, the movie companies uh, realized that despite these laws, it was still uh, easy to get the forbidden censored programs. So they designed a new scheme for DRM that they thought would never be broken. It's called AACS. And that's what's used in Blu-ray discs. Now, to some extent it has been broken. I'm not sure how much. But Blu-ray discs have another level of DRM. Not all of them, but some of them do. Where there is a program that's on the disc and it has to run and it measures the timing very carefully so that it's very hard to simulate it and fool it into thinking it's running on an approved platform. And they change that program every few months. So as far as I know, people have never been able to break these in free software. You cannot take for granted that the geeks will always win through technical ability. The people trying to attack our freedom are not always incompetent. They do learn from their defeats. Over, of underestimating the enemy is folly, and many battles have been lost through that. Don't take for granted that we will always win technologically. We have to fight them politically. <clears throat> so that's where things stand in video, except that we're starting to see video delivered over the internet. And there it's even worse because they can change their encryption format at any time. So it's almost useless to try to break it. So that means the nastiest things of all are things like Netflix. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we've seen digital restrictions management in music. Around 10 years ago, we started to see things that looked like compact discs but they were not written according to the standards for compact discs. They were written with the tracks in wavy ways or things like that. The idea being that an audio player would play them, but computers wouldn't. So we refer to them as corrupt discs. And people made lists of them saying, here's what you shouldn't buy. In some European countries, courts ruled that they couldn't put the compact disc logo on those because they weren't following the standard that that logo was supposed to mean. And that was useful. I gave a speech like this once in Spain where I had been invited by a regional government. And afterwards, as such organizations tend to do, they gave me a couple of books with beautiful photos of the region and some discs of music. And one was by somebody I'd heard of and I wanted to listen to it. Fortunately, before I opened the package, I saw that instead of the compact disc logo, it said 
copy control. This disk can be played on Windows and Macintosh systems. Meaning, not by me. So I handed it back, saying, here you see the face of the enemy. Please give this back to the store, because they shouldn't keep your money. And I've never heard that music, and I guess maybe I never will. That's sort of too bad, but there are some things that we must not tolerate. Now, <clears throat> in fact, I usually travel with a bunch of copies of CDs. I make the copies to travel with. I don't travel with the originals because many years ago my backpack was stolen with a bunch of the originals. So I don't take that risk anymore. I travel with copies. If I can't copy it, I can't travel with it and show it to the people I'm visiting and so on, and what fun would that be? So in fact, it would be totally useless. Anyway, Sony had a very clever idea for making corrupt disks. Their idea was, instead of writing the tracks in a wavy direction or whatever, they would write the tracks normally and put software on the disk that would restrict the use of the music on it. The idea was that if someone put that disk into a computer, the software would automatically run and it would take control of the machine, uh, you know, seize control of the operating system and begin changing the system, installing its own stuff into, into it. And what did these changes do? Well, basically, the way it did this is by means of what's called a root kit, which is the same sort of thing that a cracker or a virus uses to take control of a machine. Uh, and what it would do once it got control was make changes in the system, like a virus, uh, and it would change something for accessing disks so that it would restrict what people could do when they access these disks. In addition, it changed a command you would use to investigate what's in the system, so it would disguise the presence of its own code in the system. In addition, it changed the, something, a function you would use to delete this stuff from the system if you knew it was there, so that it wouldn't really delete. And uh, this is a felony, of course. But it's not the only felony Sony committed, because some of the code in there was copied from a program, a free program, that had been released under the GNU General Public License. Now, the GNU GPL is one among many free software licenses, and what's special about it is it's a copyleft license. Copyleft means it says, when you put some of this code into another program, you have to release the entire code of that other program under the same license and make the source code available to whoever you distribute it to, and you have to give them a copy of the license so that they know their rights. Sony didn't do this. That's commercial copyright infringement. And thanks to a law purchased in 1996 by companies like Sony, uh, that's a felony too. Of course, Sony was not prosecuted because U.S. prosecutors understand full well that the purpose of laws is to maintain the power of the businesses over the people. However, victims sued Sony. Unfortunately, they focused their condemnation not on the evil purpose of this scheme, but rather on the secondary evils that were the methods used. As a result, Sony was able to settle the suit by promising that in the future, when it attacked people's freedom, it wouldn't do it in these particular ways. And Sony learned its lesson because then it came out with the PlayStation 3, in which the rootkit was built in before the product was sold and was supposed to be impossible to remove, and it was AACS. But the story didn't end there, because people figured out a way to jailbreak the PlayStation 3, at which point Sony sent the police after them, and that's the egregious act for which we have these boycott Sony stickers.
So, DRM on music went away a few years ago. The record companies signed contracts to have Apple sell the music with DRM, and then they discovered they were getting shafted by the contract with Apple. So they had to sell, they had to f look for some way to get out of it. The only thing they could do was let some others sell the music without DRM. So they started doing that, and they discovered that the sky didn't fall on them. And at that point, Apple had to take off the DRM on music also. But only on music. Any other kind of medium in iTunes is likely to have DRM. So DRM is still thoroughly immoral. So, so iTunes is still thoroughly immoral. Apple is no, in no way a good guy. And DRM is creeping back on music through screaming services such as Spotify. They say, oh, of course, since this is just scream, this is just streaming, they say, all you can do is listen to it. Uh, and because this is streaming, you've got to run a proprietary program to listen. And, well, yes, it's true that proprietary program doesn't have this obvious feature of save a copy on disk. But that's because it's streaming. What would you expect? Well, this is total bullshit. That would be the most natural feature to add. The reason they require people to use a proprietary program is to avoid that capability. It's simply DRM. And as always, DRM is imposed through proprietary software. If the technology is under the user's control, then nobody else can make it mistreat the users. The users would fix it if it did. So if they want to mistreat the users, only proprietary software enables them to do so. So it's always two evils at once. At one level it's proprietary software, which is an attack on users' freedom to control their computing. And this gives them the opportunity to attack users' freedom at another level with DRM. So we need to spread the word and reject these screaming services. Out, out, damn Spotify. <laughs> and we also see DRM now on books. Around 2000 or so, there was a big hype campaign for ebooks. We were told we were all going to be reading ebooks very soon. I have some evidence that this was an organized worldwide PR campaign. But in any case, then they came out with the ebook readers and the ebooks. One publisher had the idea of getting its line of user restricting ebooks selling with a bang by starting with a biography of me. They figured that would this would appeal to the kind of early adopters, technophiles, who would be the first to buy ebook readers. So an author approached me and asked for my co cooperation, and I said, only if people can share this ebook. So it can't be encrypted. The publisher said no. However, a few months later, we found another publisher who, who said yes someone that wanted to publish it on paper, but also on the net. In fact, it was published under a free license. So you can publish your own modified versions of it if you wish. They sold it for several years and then stopped. And uh, a few years ago, I revised it, and the Free Software Foundation now publishes the second edition which is my semi-autobiography. It has my point of view and Sam Williams' point of view in contrast. Uh, I, because I, you know, I had to wrestle with the ethical question, how could I make sure this was more than just my own idea of what I want people to know and think of me? So I decided to keep all his quotations and his personal impressions and present my 
uh, corrections as alongside them, in contrast to them. So you can order that from the Free Software Foundation or read it online. In any case, ebooks flopped 10 years ago. People didn't like them, people just wouldn't buy them, and those products were all dropped. And I said, they will be back. They will try again. We have to organize to defeat them next time. And yes, they tried again. And this time, they didn't just lose right away. And what we see is that ebooks attack users' freedom, tradi the traditional freedom of readers of books. Consider, for instance, the Amazon swindle, which swindles readers out of these traditional freedoms. There's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously by paying cash, which is the only way I buy books. I will not use a credit card to buy a book. I do not identify myself because I recognize that to have a database which records all the books that each person has read threatens human rights. And especially in the UK where people can be imprisoned for the books that they have. There are, there are laws being enforced now to imprison people for the books they have. This is tyranny. And that's what you have to face and what you have to overcome. <clears throat> but with the swindle, there's no way to pay cash. The books are, all, are sold by Amazon. Amazon doesn't give people a way to, to buy a book anonymously. So this is a reason why you shouldn't buy books from an Amazon. And that applies to paper books as well. There is also the freedom to give a book to someone else after you read it. Or to lend the book to various people. And the freedom to sell the book, perhaps to a used bookstore. Well, Amazon abolishes those freedoms with digital handcuffs, <coughs> DRM, together with end-user license agreements. You see, Amazon doesn't respect private property. Amazon, in some countries, says users can't own books at all. In others, they say, in some theoretical sense, the user can own books, but without the usual rights of an owner. They, all, they say you can only read the book, you can only get a license to read the book under Amazon's conditions that take away these freedoms. <clears throat> and then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish, which Amazon eliminates through a back door. We know about this back door by observation. So we don't know all the things that Amazon can do with it. We only know what we've seen. In 2009, Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book. Now, those were authorized copies until the day they were erased. They had been obtained directly from Amazon in the usual approved way. And then they disappeared. Some users saw the books disappear as they were reading them. An Orwellian experience. And you know what book it was? It was 1984 by George Orwell. If I were writing this as fiction, I wouldn't dare make it up that way. It would be too much of a coincidence, unbelievable. But this is the fact. Well, I neglected to mention they did the same thing to Animal Farm. There was a lot of criticism. So Amazon promised that in the future it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. Exactly. Not very comforting if you consider 
what the state in 1984 did. Its evils began with destroying the books it didn't like and got nastier from there, like uh, arbitrarily executing people. Gee, uh, isn't there a U.S. president who is doing that? So, you should all read 1984. It's more, and, and then compare it with the past uh, couple of decades changes in UK law and see what you think about them. But don't read it on the swindle. And by the way, the books can disappear for other reasons too. There's a limit if someone buys new readers, because after all they don't last all that long, uh, well there's a limit to how many new readers Amazon will allow the same book to be moved to. So over time they're all going to disappear anyway. The official name of that product is the Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire. I think this is meant to suggest that the purpose of this product is to burn your books. <laughs> now, what might convince Amazon, what, what might lead the state to order Amazon to destroy people's books? Several years ago, J.K. Rowling got an injunction in Canada ordering people who had bought one of her books not to read it. Here's what happened. A bookstore put the book on display for sale before the date when that was supposed to happen. I'm not sure whether it was the bookstore's fault or the publisher's fault, but in any case, that's what happened. People walked into the store, they saw the book and bought it, and then they went away. And then someone recognized that this was a mistake and had the books taken off of display. And Rowling and her publisher went to court because some of the people had bought books and gone away and no one knew who they were. So she went to court and got an order telling those people not to read their books. In response, I call for a boycott of Harry Potter. I don't say you shouldn't read those books. I leave that to the author. I just say you shouldn't buy them. If you want to read them, read a copy that you didn't have to pay for. Perhaps borrow one if you find somebody who has a copy and is still able to lend it. Well, the store didn't have records of who the purchasers were, so they couldn't send the police around to everybody's house to take away their books. But if those were e-books e for the swindle, that's exactly what they could do. For the Harry Potter boycott, look at stallman.org slash harrypotter.html. <clears throat> and the boycott applies to movies as well. Watch it at a friend's house if, if you wish, but don't pay to do so. So, you can see that DRM is turning our, our technology into our jailers in all areas of the media. We must reject the products that are designed to restrict us. Don't choose some sort of convenience or short-term pleasure over your freedom. Think of the long term. So never 
accept a product designed to attack your freedom unless you personally have the means to break the handcuffs. So if you have the free software to watch the DVD, then there's no reason why you shouldn't have DVDs and watch them. But unless, if you don't have the means to break the handcuffs, you've got to say no to the product. However, this is not enough. Because these DRM schemes are organized. It's not just some guy trying to take away our freedom. No, it's a company organizing hundreds or thousands of people who do so, and often it's a conspiracy of companies. How do I know this? I'm no investigator. If I wouldn't be able to find out about these conspiracies, except for the fact that they're not secret. They boast about their conspiracies. These conspiracies have websites. For instance, I visited the website of AACS. I think it's AACS.com, but I don't know for sure. And they described some of their <coughs> rules. Anyone making uh, an AACS device, for instance, there was a condition out of a certain year, it was either 2011 or 2013, I don't remember anymore, analog video outputs would be banned. And the reason is they want to, quote, close the analog hole. Let me show you a couple of analog holes that they want to close. So this shows how powerful they are. They dictate changes in technology that's going to be available to us. The same website also proudly lists the companies that were the sponsors of this conspiracy. They included IBM, Intel, AMD, Microsoft, Apple, Sony, Disney, and Philips. So those are the ones we should consider to have planned to attack us. Since they are organized, we need to be organized. In defectivebydesign.org, you can find our campaign against DRM. Please sign up and participate in our actions. We need your support. So this describes what has been done to copyright law so as to attack us more. But what would a democratic government trying to serve its people do? Well, it would reduce copyright power. But how? Here are my suggestions. First, the dimension of time. Copyright lasts far too long. Things move faster nowadays, so copyright should last a shorter time, not a longer one. What I recommend is 10 years from the date of publication of a work. Why from the date of publication? Because before the work is published, we don't have copies of it, so it doesn't matter whether we would theoretically be allowed to copy them if we had them. And therefore, we might as well let the author have as long as it takes to arrange a plan of publication and start the clock then. Right now, uh, it will start from the date of finishing the work or from the author's death, which is irrelevant. Uh, so I'm proposing 10 years from the date of publication. Why 10 years? Well, the usual publication cycle is about three years. Within three years, the work is out of print. So, ten years is more than three times that. That's comfortably long. Now, not everyone agrees with this. I once proposed this at a panel discussion with fiction writers. And an award-winning fantasy writer said, ten years? No way! Anything more than five years is intolerable. Yeah, I was surprised too. Until, you see, when the publishers demand more power over us, they always say that they're doing it in the name of the creators. 
I'm convinced they use that word because it somehow uh, makes people think of divinities, right? That's something that abo are above us mere mortals. They're creators. Uh, in any case, I had, they had fooled me. You see, they, they try to present the idea that their interests and the author's interests are the same, but that's not true at all. This author, although he had won a prize, uh, his book was not a bestseller, and it appeared to be out of print. Well, his contract had a standard clause saying that if his book went out of print, the rights would revert to him, and he'd be allowed to distribute copies which he wanted to do because his fans were writing to him and saying, I can't get a copy of your book. But the publisher wouldn't admit that the book was out of print. You see, the publishers, when they demand more power, they trot out some celebrity star authors or artists and who are very famous and, the, and that they treat very well and the, those people say, yes, yes, we want more power too. And you'd never guess that the same publishers are grinding most of the artists into the ground with their heels, but that's what they do. This author's publisher wouldn't admit that his book was out of print, so he had a legal dispute with his publisher. And he had concluded that more than five years of copyright were not likely to ever do him any good, but could do him harm. Well, when I suggest 10 years, I'm not saying 10 years is exactly right. I don't know. I'm proposing it as a first rough adjustment. I think it'll get into the right range. But, you know, it could be varied. If everyone else wants five years, I'm not going to fight against it. Then there's the question of breadth. Which uses of copyrighted works should be permitted, or which uses of published works should be permitted and which could be regulated by copyright. For this, my answer is not simple because it depends on what kind of work it is. I distinguish three broad categories of works based on what kind of use they have. First of all, there are the works that you use to do practical jobs. Second, there are the works that state what certain people th think or saw. Works, you might say, of testimony. And then there are works of art and entertainment, where the contribution of the work is in the impact it makes. These are three different kinds of contribution to society. And I'm not trying to rank them in importance, but rather talk about th that they go by different paths in contributing to society. There are different kinds of contribution. So let me look at each one. First, there are the works that do practical jobs. You get one of these works so you can do a job with it. Well, if you, you freedom is having control of your own life. If you use a work to do jobs in your life, you must have control over those jobs, which means you must have control over those works. The users of those works need to control them, and what they need in order to control the jobs they're doing with those works are the four freedoms. Why those four freedoms for free software? Because those are the four freedoms that enable the users to control the jobs they're doing with those, with those programs. And therefore, the, all the works that are made for doing practical jobs must be free. This is how far my ideas about free software extend. They extend to other kinds of works that are meant for doing practical jobs with. So what are they? In addition to computer programs, there are also recipes for cooking. There are educational works. You use them to do the job of learning or teaching. There are reference works that you use to look things up and find some facts. There are fonts for displaying bodies of text. Uh, and there are other things. I'm sure you can think of some more. Uh, so for these, the users need both individual and collective control, and that leads to the four freedoms. But 
what about the works that say what certain people saw or think? That's different. You don't use those to do a job. You just use them to see what so-and-so saw or thinks. And to publish a modified version of those works is simply to misrepresent someone else. There's no particular social reason why that should be allowed. And once we don't allow modified versions without permission, there's no particular reason to allow commercial use, commercial republication, even without changes, without getting permission. Uh, and so, what I propose for these works is a somewhat reduced copyright system, which would cover all commercial use and all modification, but there is a freedom that people must have, and that's the freedom to share. When I say share, I mean non-commercially redistribute exact copies. What makes copyright today into oppression is the war on sharing. That's what has made copyright something we can't live with. So we must legalize sharing. But for these works, we don't have to go any further than legalizing sharing. We can still have copyright on commercial use, which is not sharing, and on modification, which is not sharing. <clears throat> now, the war on sharing has involved a series of attacks. The first attack was just propaganda saying, if you share, you're a pirate. In other words, that helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. I don't believe that, so I won't call that piracy. When people ask me what I think of piracy, I say attacking ships is very bad. If they ask me what I think of movie piracy, I say, I liked the first Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> If they ask me what I think of book piracy, maybe I'll talk about Captain Blood, which I read, and it was fun too. The point is, don't accept and repeat the enemy's propaganda. If you repeat the enemy's propaganda, you're helping the enemy. Now, <clears throat> but they, if they had went if they had stopped with propaganda, well, it would be annoying, but no more. But then they started developing the digital handcuffs to turn our technology into our jailers. And then they started getting the laws imposed around the world to ban the technological solutions, the tools to break open the handcuffs. And then they went even further and they started suing teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars for sharing. And then they went even further and their latest way of attacking our freedom is to abolish basic principles of justice such as no punishment without a fair trial. That's what the Digital Economy Act means. It's punishment without trial. And it shows that the publishers have declared war on the basic idea of justice because they want to maintain their power no matter what the cost to society is. But, after all, don't the publishers deserve something? What do these publishers deserve for having purchased laws that oppress us, turned our technology into our jailers, and sued thousands of teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars. What do these companies deserve? They deserve to be destroyed. They deserve total failure. They deserve to lose everything. That's what they deserve. So let them not come and plead for us about anything they deserve and probably for the way they've mistreated all the authors and artists except for the most very famous ones, they deserve even more punishment, but unfortunately I don't think there's anything more we can do to them than make them disappear. 
So, yeah, if, if we do something that's going to make them fail and blow away, great. Let's applaud when it happens. <clears throat> On the other hand, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a published com publishing company as such. If you don't do if you don't do nasty things, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and with this partially reduced copyright system, you know, publishing companies, since what they're doing is commercial after all, they would still have to get permission from authors and artists, and they would still have to pay. Except to the, it might be nice if they really did pay. Often they don't. Uh, <clears throat> so this somewhat reduced copyright system would continue to provide some income in the more in more or less the same lousy way as today to the authors and artists. And what about the well, well, and well, saying artists? Well, what about the third category works of art and entertainment. For that category, the issue of modification was difficult for me, because I see valid arguments on both sides. On the one hand, an artistic work can have an artistic integrity, and changing it can destroy that. And if you have any doubts that this is true, just look at the Hollywood adaptations of many books, and you'll see that Hollywood butchered them completely, with the permission of the author. Of course, there's some authors that don't allow their works to be butchered. Uh, maybe artistic integrity is more important to those authors. In any case, this is a valid argument on one side. But on the other hand, modifying an artistic work can be a contribution to art. Consider, for instance, the folk process by which a series of artists can transform a work and can produce something very rich. But then, can, if you want to consider only specific named authors, consider Shakespeare. Some of Shakespeare's plays used stories that were copied from other works that had been published a few decades before. If today's copyright law had existed then, those would have been infringing, which means they wouldn't have been written. And if Shakespeare, or whoever really wrote them, had complained about that, the copyright holders would have said, oh, you're just jealous, why don't you, you just want to make a cheap rip-off of my great work, why don't you go write something of your own? And since the play would never have been written, we would be unable to evaluate that accusation. But since those plays were written, we can say they're important contributions to human literature. They were not cheap rip-offs. So, Faced with these valid arguments on both sides, I eventually came up, came up with a solution. You can wait up to 10 years to publish your modified version. So, if we have this compromise reduced copyright system that covers commercial use and modification, but it lasts for only 10 years from the publication, then at most you have to wait 10 years before that copyright expires and you can publish your modified version. It's not like today where you might have to wait till after your death before you're allowed to publish your modified version. So that's what I recommend. And in particular, we must legalize sharing. We must end the war on sharing. It's no coincidence that the measures used in the war on sharing are so nasty. Because sharing is good, sharing is useful, and with digital technology, sharing is easy. So of course people share. And the only things that could stop people from sharing are nasty measures, harsh, draconian measures. So they're going to try one harsh, nasty measure after another until we finally say to them, sharing is good and we won't let you stop people from sharing. We must legalize sharing. 
In particular, that means legalizing peer-to-peer -peer sharing on the net, which, by the way, is totally not commercial. So it's clearly within the definition of sharing. <clears throat> of course, the record companies would say, oh, you're stealing from the musicians. But that's bullshit. You see, the record companies take everything from the musicians. There's nothing left for her that we could take. <laughs> the fact is, that with the exception of some stars, some stars really make money if you buy their records. But most musicians, they get nothing if you buy their records. And the reason is that the record companies have pushed them into agreeing to totally exploitative contracts, where they basically get, they don't get anything. Here's how it works. There's a certain fraction of the price which is ostensibly for the musicians, but the musicians never get it. Because, according to the contract, the production and publicity expenses are treated as advances to the musicians. They didn't get the money, but it's treated as an advance. So, this fraction <coughs> helps, quote, repay the advance, unquote. But it almost never happens that a record sells enough copies to fully, quote, repay the advance, unquote which means that it almost never happens that the musicians start getting any money. The exceptions are the long-established superstars. You see, even if you're a superstar, your records may not sell enough that you'll get any money under that contract. But eventually you get to the end, which because those contracts typically cover five or seven albums. Well, once you're done, if you're a star, you can negotiate another contract with some record company which is not exploitative, because as a star you have clout. So their later records they actually get money for, not the old ones. The old ones remain under the old contract, and the musicians still don't get any money for that. But their subsequent records, which are under the new contracts, those they actually get money from if you buy their records. Of course, they're probably rich anyway. It wouldn't matter that much if, whether they get it or not. Uh, but the other musicians, the ones who might really need help, they don't get it. Now, this is not to say they get no benefit from having a record contract. What benefit do they get? They get the benefit of being better known, so more people come to their concerts, and they have more concerts. And, and so that, that's how they make money. But we can have publicity for musicians through other means, like mail a track to your friend and say, listen to this. This is healthier because it takes money out of the publicity of music. It, it basically pries loose the grip of the hype industrial complex. So, I think this will be better for music, and better for musicians, except for the stars. The stars might not make as much, but who knows? I mean, they'll, in any case, they'll still make a lot. Now, you might wonder whether movies could be made. You've heard astronomical sums for what it costs to make a movie. Well, those sums are not real. A producer told me that more than half of those sums is actually publicity rather than making the movie. And then the part that was for making the movie, that's exaggerated too through creative accounting. So the real cost is much less than what they say. Meanwhile, a lot of use of movies is commercial use, which would be covered by this partly reduced copyright system, just as it is now. So put those two things together, and I think they could still make money. Uh, but keep in mind that Hollywood systematically makes crap. I don't just mean, I'm not just saying that it usually makes crap. I'm saying systematically. There is a system at work, and that system leads to crap. <laughs> it's not that they don't understand their work and they keep screwing up so they make crap. No, it's a system at work. Well, they have a right to make crap. Censorship is evil. 
And I'm not in favor of censoring anything merely because I think it's crap. But that's not the question. The question is, should we give up our freedom to help them make more crap? And there I say no. On the other hand, it's useful to support artists and authors. It's useful to support the people who make works. Because then they'll make more works. And there are various ways we can support them. The supposed justification for copyright is to support them. But it's a bad system to use. It oppresses us. It didn't oppress us in the age of the printing press. We could live with it. It might have been a fine system then. But now it has developed into an oppressive parasitism We've got to do something. We've got to, get, we've got to pry loose the copyright system, but the goal of supporting authors and artists is still a useful one. So here are two ways we can support them, ways that are compatible with legalizing sharing. One works through taxation. Take some public money. You could take it out of the general budget. You could tax internet connectivity and collect the money that way. The point is, distribute the money only to <coughs> authors and artists. And do so by measuring their popularity through polling, not by universal surveillance, of course, that would be bit wrong. But you don't have to do surveillance of everybody's listening and viewing habits to measure reasonably well the popularity of various works. Then you distribute this money, you divide this money among the authors and artists based on their popularity, but not in linear proportion. Linear proportion would be wasteful. Here's why. It's plausible that a star A can be a thousand times as popular as a fairly good and fairly successful artist B. With linear proportion, A would get a thousand times as much as B, which means that either we're not giving B enough for the necessities, or we're making A tremendously rich. So this is an inefficient way to use the money. Therefore, I propose to distribute it using the cube root, which looks sort of like this. The cube root of a thousand is ten. So if A is a thousand times as popular as B, with the cube root A will get ten times as much money as B. Not a thousand, just ten. So this way, you still get more money if you're more popular, but not astronomically more. So the, the effect of the cube root is to shift the bulk of the money from a few stars to the larger number of fairly good, fairly popular artists, the ones who could really use some more help. Now, the existing system is probably less than linear. You get a bigger fraction of, you know, as your popularity brings you up to a star, you get a bigger fraction than your popularity would suggest which is even worse than, than if we used linear proportion. But if we want to use this money efficiently for the goal of supporting artists in making more works, then something like the cube root is the way to do it. And that way we could support more artists in the condition of being able to do their art than the existing system does with a lot less money. And this is why I don't think it matters just precisely how we collect the money, whether it comes out of the general budget or uh, tax on internet connectivity. We'll be achieving more and paying less, so we shouldn't complain about little details like that. But I have another suggestion. Voluntary payments. Suppose every player had a button you push the button and it sends a certain amount of money, like maybe 20p 
to the artist who made the work you're playing or the last work played. And it's anonymous, of course. I, I, the UK government would hate to allow anything to be done anonymously, but that's the way it should be. And you could push the button or not. It's up to you. Nothing will punish you if you don't. But if you do, it will feel good. And that's the point. Why didn't you give a little bit of money to the artist last time you listened to something or watched something? It's too much trouble. It's not that 20p is so much money you couldn't afford it. No, it's that the work you would have had to do to give it is so much you wouldn't dream of it. If, so, if your musician was playing on the street in front of you, you would give. Because there it's easy. Well, let's make it just as easy in the internet. Now, in fact, there are musicians already that are getting enough income by asking for voluntary payments. Of course, typically much bigger voluntary payments, and only a small fraction of people actually do it, but it's enough. So if we make it easy to give these little bits of money, a lot more people will give, and it will get to be the thing you do. It will be part of the way you live, is every so often you give a little something to some artists. Of course, they're also using crowdfunding now which is another me method that seems to work. The point is, we don't need to have a war on sharing to support the arts. So we've got to end the war on sharing. Now there's one other change in copyright that we need, and that has to do with remix. Remix means taking some pieces out of various works and making something new and putting them together into a work that's totally different from what you got pieces out of. I distinguish between that and making a modified version. Making a modified version of a work, if it's not a, f a work for practical use, I'd say that should be covered by copyright. But remix is a different matter. Remix just has to be legal. Because the purpose of copyright is to encourage making works. If you interpret copyright as an obstacle to remix, you've turned it into the opposite of what it's supposed to be. That's something that could only happen when private interests have been allowed to twist the law. So, if you want more information on GNU and free software, you can look at gnu.org. If you want to find out about the Free Software Foundation, look at fsf.org. You can join the Free Software Foundation. You could join here and now if you want to pay your dues in cash. Uh, if you pay them through fsf.org, you'll have to use e-commerce. Uh, what time is it? Um, if people like, I can present my other identity. <laughs> I don't usually, I don't usually do this in talks on this topic. By the way, this is an adorable gnu that needs a home. <laughs> I am Saint Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. Emacs started out as an extensible text editor I wrote, 
which developed into a way of life for many users because it was extended so much they could do all their computing without ever leaving Emacs. And then it became a church with the launch of the newsgroup alt.religion.emacs, which you might find amusing to visit. Today in the Church of Emacs, we have no services, only software. We have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs. And we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we worship the, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. To be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must pronounce the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> then, if you become a true expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, <laughs> in which you chant part of our sacred text, the system source code. We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs. The Virgin of Emacs means anyone who has never used Emacs. And according to the Church of Emacs, offering the Virgin the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed act. We also have the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. <laughs> There is a Tibetan sect that holds that it's sufficient to do this automatically under the control of a script. But the mainstream church says that in order to gain spiritual merit from this pilgrimage, you have to type them by hand. The Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches I won't mention. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. So if you've been searching for a church to be saintly in, you might want to consider ours. But it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control or set up for your regular use, and then install a wholly free operating system and then only use and install free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you'll have the right to wear a halo if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> People have sometimes asked me whether it is a sin in the Church of Emacs to use the other editor, VI. <laughs> It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> and people have sometimes asked me whether my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. But it was a computer disk in a previous life. So thank you. Now it's time for the auction. This is an adorable canoe that needs a home. And I'm going to auction it for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy the GNU, I can sign the card or the tag for you. And if you have a penguin at home, you need to get a GNU for your penguin, because <laughs> as we all know, a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. <laughs> a penguin without a GNU is like, I'm not sure what. Uh, we can accept payment with cash or with uh, credit cards that you can use to make international purchases. 
And when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount. Because you want me to notice, right? That's the whole point of bidding. So I'm going to start with uh, 15 pounds. Do I get 15 pounds? 15 pounds. How much? 20. I've got 20. Do I get 25? 25. I've got 25. Do I get 30? 30. Who said that? Was that you? 30 pounds. I've got 30. Do I get 35? 35. I've got 35. Do I get 40? Do I get 40 pounds for this adorable canoe? Do I get 40 pounds? I've got 35. Do I get 40 pounds? I've got 40. Do I get 45 for this adorable <laughs> that needs a home? Do I get 45 pounds? 45. I've got 45. Do I get 50? I've got 45. Do I get 50 pounds for this adorable canoe that needs a home? Do I get 50 pounds to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Do I get 50? I've got 50. Do I get 55? I've got 50. Do I get 55? I've got 50. Do I get 55? 55. How much? 55. I've got 55. Do I get 60? I've got 60. I've got 60. Do I get 65? 65. I've got 65. Do I get 70? I've got 65. Do I get 70? Do I get 70 pounds for this adorable canoe that needs a home? Do I get 70 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? I've got 65. Last chance to bid 70. I've got 70. Do I get 75? Do I get 75 or more? Do I get 75? Last chance to bid 75 or more. Do I get 75 for this adorable canoe? Do I get 75? Do I get 75? Last chance. One, two, three. Sold for 70. Please come up. So how do you plan to pay? Uh, I'll pay by uh, cash Okay, yeah, I'll just be around for a while answering questions, so there'll be time. <laughs> so, she's an android, is that the idea? Uh, she's Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. She's Juliet? Yes, there's another one which is Romeo, isn't oh. yeah, This is on me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know the androids like zombies particularly, but... <laughs> So now it's time. You better go and get your get the money. While you, you, there's time if you go, but because I'm now going to answer questions. And please speak loud and clearly and slowly because I am sort of deaf. With a mic, questions. Even with a mic, if, if you speak loud, I can't hear you. No. You have to pronounce your consonants clearly for me to recognize them. Any questions? Um, hello. What? Hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, right, hello. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, you, you mentioned how um, Apple um, stopped using DRM on music. Uh, that's not quite true. They stopped using DRM on new music that they were selling, but the existing music, as far as I can tell, didn't have the DRM removed. So, really? Uh, yeah, uh, actually... I, I have some input on this. Um, I'm American and I moved here when we got married. And basically, even though DRM had already been removed, previous things in my iTunes library from a year earlier when it still existed, stopped working because I moved country, which is oh. how I got rid of iTunes. Yeah, uh, Apple have their... You can't use... Um, uh, you can't play DRM music unless your player is signed in with an Apple account. And the Apple account is related to a store, and that's related to a country. So if you move country, and you no longer have a credit card in that country, you can't use their music. Now, I'm not saying that you... Is this true for the newer music that's distributed no, without... Not the, no, not the newer music. I'm saying that if you already have... I see, we you already had yeah. DRM-covered music, is it? 
could you find me an article about this and email it to me? Yeah. Because I'll make a link to it. I have a page uh, of nasty things about Apple. Right. Because they, yeah, because I think you're being too kind about them. Okay, I didn't know this, but thank you. I will I will right. send me a page or yeah. write one giving this information and I'll link to it. Okay, yeah, it says Apple don't like people moving. <laughs> Could someone bring up a chair here so I can sit down? Thank you. Hi. So I read some time ago about your hardware. So you. I can't hear you at all. Excuse me. Uh, I did read some time ago about your hardware. You have a laptop that is fully open source. No, 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 I don't do open source. I've never been in favor of open source, and I never describe any software that way. Open source is a term used for a right-wing reaction against the free software movement. All right, I correct myself. Free, designed, hardware. Well, actually, no. No? I don't... If, as I explained, that issue isn't really relevant for hardware today. What's relevant, what's special about this computer is it doesn't require any proprietary software installed in order to run. Uh, for instance, the drivers are all free and the BIOS is free. Okay, my question was, do you have a mobile phone? Is there any other no, there is no, aware of? There is no mobile phone which respects your freedom. In it, basically, mobile phones are surveillance and tracking devices. They will send your GPS location on remote command. And they have universal back doors that allow software changes to be forcibly imposed remotely. And this has been used to remotely convert them into listening devices. Now, you've heard of software that has bugs, but in a mobile phone, you have software that is a bug. So that's why I consider mobile phones to be Stalin's dream. And that's why I don't have one. Now, they can be used to track people even without the cooperation of the phone, because the phone system can compare the time of arrival of a signal at various towers. It'll be received at various towers and each tower records when. And by subtracting, they can determine where the phone is. And they're, they're constantly making more and more cells in the network. They have these things called micro cells and nano cells. So often they can tell without the phone's cooperation very precisely where the person is. Like, the person's in this room. I consider this unacceptable. And I don't know a solution to it. You know, people who are working on mobile phones with free software, unfortunately the project that exists at present doesn't get all the way there. But even if all the software in the mobile phone were free, that wouldn't block tracking the, the whereabouts of the phone by seeing what cells it's talking to. And that tracking is getting more and more precise. So what would you have to do? You'd have to carry a parabolic antenna. Isn't that true for Wi-Fi network? Let's say we have a... Not in the same way. For instance, if I connect to a Wi-Fi network where I'm visiting somebody, uh, I don't think the information about my machine is is transmitted to anyone. Now it might be so if the if the wireless network router belongs to some ISP, then indeed that ISP could be collecting the information. I should get in the habit of changing my MAC address before I connect to any such thing.
And indeed, I won't use the Wi-Fi networks that require users to identify themselves. I just consider them off limits. What do you think of Secure Boot? Uh, well, Secure Boot is a feature in new PCs where it's possible to put in some keys and then the machine will only boot software signed with those keys. If this is under control of the user, then it's a possibly useful security feature. However, Microsoft wants to convert it into restricted boot. And what do you think of Red Hat's solution? Red Hat's solution is, well, and I wouldn't say, I mean, I won't exactly condemn it, but we won't use it. Uh, basically, uh, to have control of your computing, you've got to be able to turn off those keys. And you've got to be able to put in your own software. And if anyone's been assigned it, it will be you. I think we're running a little short of time, so uh, I don't know, a couple more questions, that, if that's all right with everyone? Yeah, but meanwhile, we've got various things for sale over here. If you'd like to support the Free Software Foundation uh, by paying a little bit, well, of course, we also accept donations. But uh, we have buttons and uh, the metal stickers as well as the lapel pins. Um, I've been involved in Occupy London for the um, last few months, and I just wondered whether you'd heard of the Community Bill of Rights, which um, the um, no, send me an email about it. Okay, because it's similar to what the Software Foundation has been doing, but for um, other environmental and community concerns. It's a very different issue, so I don't. I wouldn't want to assume a priori that the right, the same answer is right for it. But I'm interested in hearing. So the last question, I think. Sure. <coughs> Um, I've seen in my life um, a number of websites being shut down for certain reasons, but for the first time, in, certainly in the UK, I've started to see websites being blocked by ISPs en masse. What's your opinion on that? <clears throat> well, okay, I believe that sharing needs to be legalized. The Pirate Bay is a sort of edge case, uh, because it doesn't charge for anything well, it doesn't actually distribute things itself. It, uh, it provides information about where to find others who are distributing. It, it makes money from ads. Uh, is that commercial or not? I'm not really sure. But what's clear is that the peer-to-peer -peer networks are not commercial. They don't involve any company doing anything. Uh, so those have got to be legalized. But in general, uh, I think that the you know, censorship is very dangerous. And therefore, uh, unless there's some really strong reason for blocking, thing, blocking sites, they shouldn't be blocked. Now, I heard from somebody who said he was going to switch to a small ISP because the small ISPs don't have to block those sites. And this might be a very good thing if it leads to the creation of lots of small ISPs. But meanwhile, uh, thanks to the Digital Economy Act, it's crucial for people to have unlocked wireless networks. If you put a password on your wireless network, then you are acting as an enforcer for an evil form of tyranny. So, have wireless networks without passwords. That's a form of resistance against that tyrannical law. Thanks very much for uh, your time today, RMS, and thanks, uh, thanks everyone for coming along.